again. Great to see you guys. Um, if you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Deuteronomy chapter 32. And while you guys are opening up to Deuteronomy chapter 32, let's pray and ask God just to bless tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, for again this chance to get into your word, Lord. Your word is exciting and there's so many rich things here and so many warnings, God, as we see Moses warning the children of Israel um, here in, in the last part of Deuteronomy and preparing them to go into the promised land. And Lord, telling them the consequences of their disobedience. Lord, let it be a warning to us. We want to be children that are obedient. We don't want the consequences. We don't want the curses. We want the blessings. So help us, Lord, to learn from this and to be instructed from it. And Lord, to be encouraged by it. I pray you'd build us up, Lord, in your word. Um, and so, Lord, just again, you be the teacher tonight. You be the one that instructs. And we thank you, Lord, for your word and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we shift gears now and looking at chapter 32. Remember what we've been looking at. I don't know if we'll finish Deuteronomy tonight because I took some time there at the beginning to talk a little bit about um, Halloween. But again, Moses has been giving them their final instructions. Um, some believe it maybe was a shorter number of sermons and just longer time they spent listening. Some believe it was broken up into more sermons. We don't know for sure. But what we do know is he was getting them ready to go into the promised land. And so to enter into the promised land, he's giving them these final instructions and these things that, um, you know, they need to be doing and to be warned of. And, and because God sees all things in advance... God knows all things. He sees all things in advance. He sees that when they get into the land, they're going to rebel. And so it's kind of interesting when you read this, God talks about their rebellion in past tense, but it hadn't happened yet. Isn't that interesting? And then God talks about, he says, and I'm going to get mad. I'm going to be upset. It's like, he already knows in advance. You know, it's like, can you imagine as a parent? Now today you're going to do some things that aren't good and I'm going to be really upset, you know, and you know about it, but right now we're calm and it hadn't happened yet. And so everything's great. Um, but again, it's not that God is moody or I want to give a wrong impression by, by saying that. I'm not trying to be flip about it, but is it, is it, it, it is interesting to see God's perspective, knowing all things and knowing when we're going to mess up in one way, it's like, wow, that's kind of freaky and God already knows. And so, wow. On the other hand, it's very encouraging in this, in a strange way in that he knows what we're going to do wrong in the future. And he still died for us. Isn't that nice? Well, I'm, I'm clean with God right now, but what about what I do next year? Well, he died for next year. Is everybody aware of that? That doesn't mean that we're not repentant. That doesn't mean we don't confess it, but the Lord died for us knowing what we would do. Uh, you know, again, as, 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 uh, as one man said, I'm glad that he died, you know, for me before I, um, before I, you know, before I was born, because he certainly wouldn't have afterwards, you know, which is not true. It was tongue in cheek. Um, but God knows all things. And now he's going to use chapter 32 to talk about this song of Moses. And remember last week, God had said, they're going to rebel. They're going to do all these things. So Moses, I want you to write them a song because people remember songs. So write this song, drive it in their memory. And then when they do fall away and they find themselves in captivity in other lands and in rebellion to God, that song will come back to them and drive them back to the Lord. So uh, like an old worship song, maybe if you're like backsliding and you're doing things you shouldn't do and that worship song pops in your mind, you're like, you know, what am I doing? You know, give us clean hands, give us a pure heart. Let us not, you know, you know, give our soul to another, this kind of thing. And you realize that's exactly what I'm doing. And so you can see how just how songs can have an impact. That's what this, the song of Moses. Now I'm gonna start in 3130 because again, it gives us a run and go. Notice it says, then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel, the words of this song until they were ended. And here it goes. It says, give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, and my speech distill as the dew, as the raindrops on the tender herb. And again, dew would come down and be freshness to the grass and freshness to the ground and spring what is dead to life. He says, as showers on the grass, for I proclaim the name of the Lord. Now, this is interesting to me because when Moses would proclaim the name of the Lord, remember God said he would pass before Moses a long time before this. And Moses said, Lord, let me see your glory. He said, I'll pass by you. I'll put my hand over you in the crevice and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. And as he walked by, God told him his, all of his attributes. You know, who he was, long suffering, merciful, forgiving to this many generations, all these things. That is proclaiming the name of the Lord. The name is who you are. And so what Moses is saying now under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what God is saying through Moses is, I'm going to proclaim my name again through Moses. And now Moses through this song is going to proclaim the name of the Lord and who he is. He says, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. That is everything he does is perfection. 
For all his ways are justice. I love that. There's nothing that's unjust about the Lord. You know, sometimes he gets accused of being unjust, but there's nothing unjust about the Lord. Everything about him is right and is just. A God of truth and without injustice. Now, why is, I'm emphasizing this because he says it more than once in the same verse. Again, people that say, how could God? And why did God? If God had only, and they get upset with God. He says, God's done nothing wrong ever. He never will do anything wrong. Everything he does in our life is perfect and it is just. It is not unjust. And so he's just proclaiming his name. He can't do things that are wrong because he's a just God. Righteousness and upright is he. Or rather righteous and upright is he. And then he goes on now talking about what the children of Israel have done and will do. Notice what he says. They have corrupted themselves. Now imagine being in a foreign land and going, God, why have you abandoned me? You know, a lot of the Jews in the Holocaust. That was their cry. Why has God forgotten us? Why did God abandon us? If they'd known this song, this verse could have come back to their mind. And what is the verse? He says, they have corrupted themselves. When you find yourself somewhere and your life falling apart and you're wondering, why is my life falling apart? Now, again, if you're walking with God and it's just a trial, that's one thing. But let's say you've walked away from God, your life is falling apart and you knew this verse and you memorized it and it was in some song and it comes back to your mind. They have corrupted themselves. What God is saying is, this is you've done this to yourself. I didn't do this to you. You did this to you. And when we recognize that we're the ones that are guilty, what does it do? It drives us back to the Lord. It drives us to repentance. They have corrupted themselves. They are not his children. So they're not living as the children of God. They're following the, the children, of basically the, living like the devil's kids. They're not his children. Why? Because of their blemish. A perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? Again, just declaring he's the creator. He's the one that established you. He's your father. Why are you turning away from him? Remember the days of old. He goes, go back and think about what it was like when God was blessing. Remember that. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you. You know, it's almost like today for those of us that the new generation coming up and not knowing, you know, what our nation used to be like. Our nation is nothing like it used to be. And those of us that are, you know, probably even 45 and up, but 50 and up for sure, we know that. We recognize the change that's happened in our nation. And some of you that are older than that, you recognize even a greater change in our nation because you see what's happened. But it, what he's saying is, is you know what? Be reminded of that. Remember what your founding fathers did. Remember what, the, what, what, what was going on in your nation and your people when, when God was blessing because that turns you back to say, I want that again. We need that again. That this generation needs that now. He says, your elders, they'll tell you. When the Most High divided the inheritance to the nations... When he separated the sons of Adam, that is all peoples, look at this. He set the boundaries of the peoples, that is of the earth, all the peoples of, that were descendants of Adam, which is everyone. Look at this. According to the number of the children of Israel. You don't think Israel's special in God's eyes? Here's what God is saying. Every nation on the planet and all their boundaries, I based that off of the children of Israel. Now, how he did that, it doesn't give us details. It doesn't give us the details of how he did that. But my guess would be if you did your research and you found out the number of the nations of the world and different things and studied Israel enough and things God, God would show you no doubt what it is, but God did that. And so the nations of, depending on the numbers of the children of Israel, he's established this thing where he basically took them as the center point and the whole earth, he says, and I'm gonna distribute everybody around the earth based on my kids, children of Israel. Isn't that amazing? And so again, a very privileged people, a very special people to the Lord. And now we're a part of that family. So that includes us as well. We're not, the, we're not the children of Israel, I'm, I, I, but we're included in the family now. We're grafted in. For the Lord's portion, you know, everybody of the children of Israel got their portion, their inheritance. He goes, here's the Lord's inheritance. The Lord's portion is his people. And Jacob is the place of his inheritance. It is amazing to me over and over in the scripture, God says that we're his inheritance. Think about that. God refers to that all the time. What's God's inheritance? Us. The nation of Israel and the Gentiles who are now saved in the Lord. It's interesting, uh, working on this book uh, about the rapture, I, I, again, I've, I've always looked at it in the sense of the rapture being the wedding day of the Lord, but over the years it began to, to develop even more in just this whole, the way the Lord looks at it. We look at it as, okay, all this trouble's coming on the earth and God's gonna sound the trumpet and we're all gonna be out of here. Jesus has a whole different perspective of the rapture. And that is he wants his bride. And over all the years of doing the weddings, I've seen how, 
how badly the husbands want their bride. And, and I, I began to realize that this is what God, you're his inheritance. You're his desire. He's waiting on the day he gets to walk down the aisle with you, the church. And so it's an exciting day for him. For us, it's the day we get out of him. Get out of here. For him, out of him, boom. For him, it's the day we get to be his, his joined to the Lord. It's in a spiritual way that we can't even really understand yet. He's waiting on that day. Now, I've seen a lot of fancy weddings. What's it going to be like at the wedding supper of the Lamb? What's the ceremony going to be like? What is the Lord going to be arrayed like? What are we going to be arrayed like other than in white, you know, pure white linen cleansed of the Lord? You know, what's it going to be? I think about how important it is to a bride, their dress. If we were as concerned about our spiritual cleanness before the Lord and how we're dressed before our heavenly husband, so to speak, as brides are about their dress, how pure would the church be? How, as we're preparing for the Lord to take us out of here, how would it be looking? Well, you know what? I want to make sure that, you know, the, the spiritual sleeves are here. I want to make sure that I have this kind of thing. And I want to do this. And, you know, I want to have a trainer. I don't want to have a trainer or whatever. Now, I know it's hard. These are weird things. And it's hard to, you know, uh, especially for a guy. All right. It's hard for me to imagine that way. But there is an analogy there where if we were so, if we were as concerned about making sure that everything was ready in the sanctuary and that all the proper clothing and that, 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 that you know, the, all the colors, dress, you know, everything matched color wise and the flowers are in the right place and the lighting is just right and, the, and the, everything ready for the reception. That's what God's doing in heaven. He's getting ready for a huge wedding and you guys are the guests of honor. You're going to be the ones walking down the aisle of heaven where some are going to be joined to the Lord. Then we're going to go to this huge banquet called the wedding supper of the lamb. We're going to be at this meal, not just a reception, but a meal for seven years, no calories. <laughs> Think about it. Isn't that going to be great? Yeah. And so, and then when we're done, we're going to get up just as skinny as we sat down. And he's going to say, saddle up. And you're all going to be able to ride horses. Don't worry. You're going to get on horses, the Bible says. Whatever a heavenly horse is going to be like. And the Bible says we will ride through the universe from the third heaven down to this earth with the Lord leading the way where he will show up at Armageddon and destroy the armies of the world that are trying to defeat him. We will go with him to Jerusalem. He will establish his throne on Jerusalem and we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years in this just unbelievable setting of a restored world with purity and holiness and a God that is just in every way. Is that not going to be awesome or what? Now, that is exactly what he's talking about here when he, you know, again, what he's talking about, we're his inheritance. We think of it, yeah, okay, okay, we're, you know, you can read right past that. But he's looking at that day going, this is the day that I've been waiting for, for eternity. And, and the honeymoon never ends. It's not going to be like after, you know, a, a million years, you know, it's like growing tired of us, you know, and the Lord goes, well, you know, it's not like it used to be when we first met, you know, at the rapture. And he's going to love us just the same forever with just as much intensity and care. It's gonna be amazing. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. The Lord's portion is his people. Verse 10, he found him in a desert land and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. So notice this, he took him out into the wilderness, talk about the 40 years in the wilderness, encircled him, that is he put a protection wall around him. He taught him, that is the instruction. Moses was giving them the word of God. He kept him as the apple of his eye. The apple of your eyes is, is, is really that the center of your eye, the pupil of your eye. It's, it really has a reference to that natural it's that place right there where your eyes, you, you protect it the most naturally. You, can, you're, you have a natural reflex. If something gets near your eye, you just move. It's natural. You don't even try it. It's not like, ooh, my eye's going to get hit. Dodge. I mean, if something gets near your eye, what do you do? You, you do. It's a natural reaction. What he's saying is, I encircled you and I protected you. It's so natural for me to protect you. It was so important for me to protect you that any harm that would have come, I immediately responded. I immediately responded. And I protected you. You're the apple of my eye. And look at this. This is the one that gets me. We've talked about it before. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. So the Lord alone led them and there was no foreign God with them. Now you would lose this if you don't know how an eagle does. I won't take a long time on this because I know I've talked about it before. But the eagle will get on the nest over the young. Stirring them up means kicking them out of the nest that they learn to fly. 
And I've not witnessed this, but it's my understanding that when they kick the eagle out of the nest, and of course they're usually up on some very, very high place, that the little one doesn't know it can fly yet, and it actually screams as it's falling. It's you know, screaming, and you know, audibly can hear it. The mom dives down and grabs it right before it hits the ground. She'll let it fall as far as she can because she's trying to teach it. You know, you need to try to get out of this, all right? Don't just let mom help you. And she does it until, you know, they get it. And suddenly they can fly. Now, he uses this as an analogy of the way God deals with us. You ever felt you're falling and certain doom is coming? Certain destruction. There's no way out of this. You see the rocks coming fast. You've been abandoned. Everything's falling apart. I'm going to die for sure. That's basically what he's saying. God will do that on purpose in our lives sometimes. And what do we do when it happens? Ah, right? But he, he always rescues us at the end. God will always rescue us. Why? He's teaching us to trust him. He's teaching us to, to, to learn to fly, to, to have faith that he's going to do that. So I love this whole picture that he gives of the way that he does with the eagle. He says, so the Lord alone led him and there was no foreign God with him. He made him ride in the heights of the earth that he might eat the produce of the fields. He made him draw honey from the rocks and oil from the flinty rock, curds from the cattle and milk from the flock with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the choicest wheat and you drank wine. Uh, and the blood of grapes. So God's given you everything you could need to the full is what he's saying. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. Now Jeshurun is a pet name for Israel. Isn't that great? You know, you have names for your kids. You know, they get a name when they're little and, and I don't want to embarrass my kids by talking about their names when they're little. But every parent has this. It just kind of happens. Something happens and you say their name. Um, you know, I, I, it just kind of comes out. I don't know why. Maybe it's fitting. Maybe it rhymes with their name, whatever. God does that. God says, he, he calls Israel Ariel, and he also calls them Jeshurun. And so, he, so when you see Jeshurun or Ariel, he's talking about the nation of Israel. He says, but Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, you grew thick, you were obese. That is not necessarily in speaking of their literal physical state. He's talking about how God had blessed them as a nation and as a people. They had had everything they wanted for so long that they had just become saturated with all the blessings of the Lord. And the danger of that is you begin to take it for granted. Rather than realizing this is a blessing of the Lord, I deserve this somehow. He says, then he forsook God who made him. So, you, you know, hey, I just, I deserve this. I did this. It's mine. And, and forget God. And scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. Again, I'm not trying to pick on our nation, but guys, I can't help but use the analogy. I see America today and much of America doesn't realize why is America so great? I know you've heard me harp on this. I won't go long. I'll be quick. But the bottom line is, why are we so blessed? Not because we're smarter, not because our, our constitution is better, although it is a great writing by our founding fathers. It is because God blessed us because we honored God. And we honored God, we grew fat as a nation. We became the wealthiest nation on the earth. We have the strongest military on the earth. All the blessings, things that other nations can only dream about. And because of that, now you know what? Now we think, well, it's just our system and we've got it figured out and we did it and now we're just kind of forgetting God. Now, the church isn't, but the world is just forgetting God. God. God had nothing to do with this. Matter of fact, remove him out of everything. So they're not even recognizing what it was that made them great. That's what God is saying to the nation of Israel. You don't even recognize why you're great. You think you did this. You think you came up with this. You didn't come up with this. I did this. Why do you think when all the nations of the world in 1948, when Israel declared themselves a nation and all their surrounding nations, the five different countries, came in to attack them at one time, they weren't even established as an official nation yet. Why was it they not only defeated them all, they drove them back and got more territory? Because they're so awesome. And they had been trained for years and been a nation for a long time and they were prepared and ready. God brought them in the land they were trying to survive. They were doing the best they could. And all the nations around them said, we're going to come kill you all. And they all closed in at one time. Now, if I just gave you that scenario and said, what do you think happened? How many of us would make a guess they were, all, they were wiped out? They wiped out the enemy. Drove them back. And, and, and amazingly, they started bragging about how great they were. It had nothing to do with them. And then again, in 1967, their enemies attacked them. Israel wiped them out and got more land. 1972, the enemies attacked them again. They wiped them out. And they got more land. Every time they've attacked Israel, God has given Israel more land because he said, I'm going to bring you back in the land and I'm going to slowly expand you. And it's interesting, all the peoples that hate them, that try to come and take everything away from them, they, they must be frustrated as they can be because every time they try to come and take it away, God gives them more. 
And so, you know, I, it's, it's interesting, I, I, you know, I, uh, to watch God work is an amazing thing, but, but this is the problem they had. He says, you think that it's somehow you did it, you're scornfully esteeming the rock of your salvation. They don't even acknowledge Jesus today. And they're back in the land and being blessed because Jesus, that's why. They provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods. Isn't that interesting? There is a good jealousy. And, and he, he says here, God, God was jealous for them because he loves them. And they were provoked, God was provoked because they were worshiping these foreign gods. He says, with abominations, they provoked him, that is God, to anger. They sacrificed to demons and not to God. Now that's interesting. To gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. They had their little idols and they sacrificed to them. And it's interesting that he says here, behind those idols were actually demons. Isn't that interesting? You think, ah, it's just a little idol. No, he says there are demons behind that. So those who would worship these little statues and these little things, he goes, that's demonic. And there's, there's demons that are actually worshiping in the midst of that, although they don't know it, they're doing it. Of the rock who begot you, you're unmindful. And you've forgotten the God who fathered you. And when the Lord saw it, he spurned them because of the provocations of his sons and daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. It's like, okay, you don't want me? Now, this is what I talked about, a difference in judgment and God simply just saying, letting the people have their own way. He says, you don't want me in your government? You don't want me in your schools? I'll leave. Let's see what happens to your schools. Oh, really? Mass shootings. Interesting. Rape. Drugs. Hmm. Hmm. I don't say that in a mocking way. I'm saying, God said, that's what's going to happen. You don't want me in your government? All right, it's going to become corrupt. Like every other government in the world, everybody's going to be out for their own. They're going to take bribes. They're going to be out to themselves. I mean, you see the level of corruption going on in our government at the, at the highest levels right now. I mean, across the board, everywhere. I mean, in both parties. Why? God's been removed. Now, there is a remnant that's there. But for the large part, he says, if you do that, now again, he's speaking to the nation of Israel, but these are principles. He says, I'll hide my face from you. Now, this goes on a personal level too. If we say we don't go, want God, then God will say, all right, let's see how well you do. <laughs> you know, you're on your own. You don't realize how blessed you are. And he says, I will see what their end will be for they're a perverse generation. Children in whom is no faith. They've provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. But I will, prove, I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. Now he's talking about us. He says, the Jews, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make them jealous by what I do in the Gentiles. See, this is what, you know, we give to the nation of Israel. And we give to different organizations. We give to an organization over there called the Joshua Fund that ministers to the poor uh, Arabs and the poor Jews, both. God loves them both. Um, I was speaking with a public official recently that had heard that we give to Israel. And she asked me, she said, you know, why do you give to, to both Arabs and Jews? You're a Christian church. Why are you giving to the Arabs? She was just curious. I said, because God loves them both. God died for both the Jew and the Arab. He loves them both. So we love them. And we want to, we want to let them know through the gospel that we love them. So we give this organization that gives to them in their need and tells them about the love of Jesus. Well, uh, we also give to Ariel, which is a, a, a city there in Samaria. And they're not a believing people. They're unbelievers. And we've been involved with them for probably 15 years financially, as well as going there and supporting them and just encouraging them and, and helping them even in, in, in getting their message out through WIM. You know, uh, Avi Zimmerman, the, one of the city guys there, you know, that we know well. We're trying to, he did some spots on the radio for a while. We've really tried to help them. And, and you say, why would you do that? Why would you, not, not to advanced Judaism, it just their nation there, their people there rather within the nation. Why would you do that? Well, number one, God says, those who bless Israel, I will bless. I like getting blessed. And I like seeing God bless Calvary Chapel Knoxville. So that means I'm going to give to Israel because it's a guaranteed blessing. You can't lose on that when God promises, Genesis 12. But also provoke them to jealousy. When they see how excited we are about their God, Wow, look what your God has done for your nation. Look how he's brought you back. Look, Avi, this is fantastic. You, did you ever think, look what he's doing, how he's blessing you guys and everybody's trying to do away, but you guys are thriving and you're growing and all these things. I mean, God is blessing you guys so much. And they'll just kind of go, yes, 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 he is. You know, but you can tell me, they don't, you know what I'm saying? There's not this relationship. But God says, I will use that. When they see you, they're gonna go, why is it? You know, you know when you're in high school and 
you know, or, or you're younger, or maybe there's somebody, you know, you, and, and you're in that dating stage, or somebody you think maybe you're gonna have a relationship with or get married, and you're thinking, I don't know if this is the person or not, and somebody comes along and shows them attention, it's like, huh, wait a minute, that one's mine. It provokes you to jealousy, doesn't it? God says we as the Gentile church, we do that to the Jews. They watch us come over and bless their nation. They watch us laugh and give them money for their nation and help them thrive and, and promote them and do all these things. They watch us defend them and say, leave Israel alone. And they watch us do that and they're going, you know, we wouldn't do that for you. Because we think Jesus isn't our Messiah. As a matter of fact, you guys, without being so nice to us, you kind of bug us. But you guys are really nice to us. And, and what's going on here? And when they see that love and that relationship that we have with the Lord, there's power in that. It drives them to the Lord. God says, I'm going to make you jealous by those who are not a nation. Again, just the Gentiles around the world. They're not, we're not a nation. We're just Gentiles scattered around the earth. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. You look at the Gentiles. I mean, foolish people. And, and yet we didn't grow up with God and we didn't know God and God saved us. We weren't a part of the history of Israel and God saves us. They're jealous of that. For a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn to the lowest hell. I shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Not just the mountains, but the foundations. I will heap the disasters on them. I will spend my arrows on them. These are the Jews as they rebel. He said, this is the warning. Again, I wonder what the part of this song sounded like, you know. <laughs> Probably wasn't upbeat, you know. It's like, I, 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 you can't, I don't know what the tune was, you know. I'll heap disaster on them. Spend my arrows, you know. And anyway, pierce their liver. and Anyway, whatever. <laughs> They shall be wasted with hunger, devoured by pestilence, and bitter destruction. I also will send against them the teeth of beasts with the poisoned serpents of the asp, or rather of dust. The asp is a snake, is why I said that, and I just realized I... But dust. <laughs> and they're funny snakes. I mean, they, they, they will make you... I'm just kidding. Silly. The sword shall destroy outside... <laughs> there shall be terror within. For the, how do you, re, now we're laughing. Terror within. <laughs> this is not funny. Let's regroup. The sword shall destroy outside. There shall be terror within for the young man and the virgin, the nursing child with the man of gray hairs. I would have said, I will dash them in pieces. That is, I would have said, you know, Israel, I'm going to destroy you all. Wipe you out. I will make the memory of them to cease from among men had I not feared the wrath of the enemy. Note this, lest their adversaries should misunderstand, unless they should say our hand is high, that is we are great, and it is not the Lord who has done this. He says, if it wasn't for people thinking that they were great, I would let them wipe you out. But if they came to wipe you out and they thought they were the ones with the power, and able, they would think that their God is great and not the true God of heaven. So I'm not going to let them do that. God says, I'm going to defend my name. It's interesting when he talks about bringing the nation of Israel back in the last days, Ezekiel chapter 36, 37, and then that area in there. He says, I'm doing this for my great name. I'm going to bring Israel back and I'm going to defend them and I'm going to establish them in the last days for my name's sake. You know why? Because they've denied me. And they've been scattered all over the world denying me. I'm bringing them back. I'm showing that I'm the Lord and it's me that's doing this. For they're a nation void of counsel. They won't listen to the word of God. Nor is there any understanding in them. They hear it, but they don't know it. Oh, that they were wise. That they understood this. That they would consider their latter end. If you could just see what's going to be the end of all this activity, you would stop it. How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them? In other words, you're going to be so easily defeated. And how could that happen were it not God turning you over to the enemy? For their rock is not like our rock. Their gods, if you will, what they depend on is not like the God of Israel. Even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. He says, you're going to even get friendly toward homosexuality. No wonder you're being judged. Wow, this is heavy, isn't it? Very applicable to today. God is saying when a people turns that way and they become bearing the fruit of Sodom and Gomorrah, he says that leads to judgment. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Clusters are bitter. Their wine is poison of the serpents and the cruel venom of the cobras. Is this not laid up in store with me, sealed up among my treasures? Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time. So, you know, I'm the one that'll judge, God is saying. For the day of their calamity is at hand and the things that come hasten upon them. For the Lord will judge his people. What a sad verse that is. 
How sad to read the Lord will judge his people. It shouldn't be that way. It should be the Lord will bless his people. But when his people rebel against him, what happens? Judgment. And he'll have compassion on his servants. That is, look, those of his people that rebel will be judged. But those who stay faithful, those who honor the Lord, those who are humble, those that repent, those that serve him, he says, I'm going to have compassion on them. When he sees their power is gone and there's no one remaining bond or free. So when he sees that we're weak, but we're faithful to him, God will rescue. He, uh, he will say, where are their gods? The rock in which they sought refuge. You know, they, you had all these other gods you were looking to. Where are they now? Who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering? By the way, drink offering. Did you know, listen, this will blow you away. So Travis, I don't think Travis shared this. I don't think I shared it. But when Travis went with his guys down to the Key West and that region there and, and you know, to uh, do the outreach of the mission trip we went on last month, they were down at the end of the Keys, and it's the southernmost part of the U.S. at the very end. And they were down there, and there's this wall right there next to the ocean. And they're there at this wall, and somebody drives up in a car and drops off a six-pack, puts it on the wall, and drives off. And, of course, you, you're thinking, okay, that's weird. Why did somebody just drop a six-pack off on this wall? And so they asked the neighbors around there, why'd this guy come and drop, drop a six-pack off? He said, oh, well, there's a group of people here who make offerings to the sea god. And they bring her six packs. I'm thinking, you just had a hurricane. The last thing you need is for her to be drunk. <laughs> uh, bring her a Starbucks, you know, or something. Something that'll wake you up and alert, you know. But you get the point. It's like, that's in America. That's America. And you know what's funny? There, there wasn't a, they also showed another story. There was some lady there that was sitting on that wall that was so drunk and wobbling, she was about to fall in the ocean. I'm thinking, she's figured it out. If I sit here, they'll come and bring it to this God and I'll just drink their offerings. <laughs> and I, I'm sure that's probably what's really happening. But again, it's just bizarre to me that they would actually think these sacrifices, he's saying, who's drinking these offerings you're making people? And when I went to Vietnam, they set these little shrines up and they bring food and drinks to these gods. And you walk by a shrine right there and there's this, you see this little fire smoldering and some drinks sitting there and some food. I'm thinking, you're kidding. I mean, I, what, how does Satan trick you into thinking that somehow they're going to eat that? It's there it sits. They're not eating it. Anyway, he's saying, you, who, who drank this? Let them arise and help you. Let them be your refuge. Hey, if that sea god was so great, why in the world does she just allow your whole region to get wiped out with a hurricane? You've already been offering her six packs. She wiped you out anyway. Can you not see how foolish? You need to cry to the God that created the sea. That's where you're going to find your help. He says, now see that I, even I, am he. He says, you worshiping all these false gods, I'm God. I am he. There is no God besides me. Now, we covered this a couple of weeks ago on Sunday, so I won't extrapolate. There's my big word for the night. But either way, there's no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. He says, I'm, I'm ultimate authority, for I raise my hand to heaven and say, as I live forever. So he, he swears by his own name. He says, there's no greater name he can talk by. He says, if I wet my glittering sword and my hand takes hold of judgment, I will render vengeance on my enemies and repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the heads of the leaders of the enemy. Rejoice, O Gentiles. Now this would be, again, remember to a Jew, they're singing a song. Here's the Jews singing a song to their God and not believing that God loves the Gentiles. Remember, the Jews, especially in Jesus' day, and I don't know how consistent, I haven't done enough research to, to proclaim how consistent this was throughout their existence as a nation. But in a big portion of their nation and their history, and, and especially in Jesus' day, their pastors, their leaders taught that God created Gentiles just for the purpose of burning in hell. There was no other reason a Gentile, you were only created to eternally suffer. You were only created to burn in hell. That was it. There's no other purpose for you. Now, with that belief system, how did they handle this when they sang this verse? It went against their theology, didn't it? Rejoice, O Gentile. Or Gentiles, they're created, for, they're created for hell. How can they rejoice? Because God's word trumps, you know, what they were teaching. He says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. For he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his land and his people. Well, wow, long song. So Moses came, by the way, those of you that say, this song has too many words. Tell Moses that, you know. 
Verse 42, and the judgment came, and the, I'm sorry, anyway, anyway, <clears throat> verse 44, so Moses came with Joshua, the son of Nun, and spoke all the words of this song in the hearing of the people. And Moses finished speaking all these words to Israel, and he said to them, set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe all the words of this law. For it is not a futile thing for you, because it is your life. For by this word you shall prolong your days in the land which you cross over to the Jordan to possess. I love this. He's saying basically the Bible is not a futile thing because it is your life as a believer. Guys, God's word's your life. It's your life blood. It's what, it's what makes us who we are as believers. Don't treat it as a futile thing. Honor it. Spend time in it. Observe it, you know, and realize the God behind it. Not just, again, not just as a study a study book, so to speak, relationally has to be there, but he's saying, this is your life. Then the Lord spoke to Moses that very same day, saying this, go up this mountain to Abarim, uh, which is in uh, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, across from Jericho, view the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel as a possession, and die on the mountain which you shall ascend, and be gathered to your people, just as Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor, and was gathered to his people. It's kind of neat, when we went to uh, Jordan, we actually saw the, you know, Mount Nebo and the valleys around it, but nobody knows where he was buried in those valleys. God has him hidden, had his body hidden, but we did see Mount Hor, it's a very um, um, identifiable mountain. You can see exactly where uh, Aaron walked up, and it's kind of this just rock jutting up or whatever right in the middle of everything you could see, and it would have been very dramatic seeing Aaron walk up there and just be up on top, and then everybody comes back without him. He's died. And now we see the same thing. Moses is up here on Mount Nebo, and Moses is going to die, and we'll talk more about that next time. But he says, you'll be gathered to your people because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah, uh, Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, here's why. All these bad things, again, why did, why did Moses not get to see the promised land? Because you did not hallow me, that is, show me as holy before the people in the midst of the children of Israel. The consequence, um, you know, there's a, there's a higher standard for the leaders in God's church. There just is. It's all through Scripture. Paul talks about it in the New Testament. Paul says, okay, pastors here, pastors and elders, here's what you've got to, you have a higher standard. And he goes, now, now deacons, okay, you can do this. And, and the body of Christ, it's not that there's ever any sin that's okay, but God says, the more you know, the more you're accountable, and the more you represent God, the more accountable you are. Moses represented God before the people. He was greatly accountable because he was meeting with God face to face, being the example of who God was. Moses was setting the standard. And he says, Moses, you misrepresented me back there. And although Moses was this you know, friend of God and that close, there's no favoritism with God. There's no partiality. He says, you can't go in. And we, of course, we, we already saw that Moses begged him, Lord, please, let me go. No, don't. It's like a father with a kid. Don't ask me again. I've already decided you can't go in. But it's so neat of the Lord because God knew that he would get to one day. You know, Moses is going to be with us when the Lord comes back. That whole scene we talked about when we come back after the big reception at the wedding feast. Moses is going to be there, you know, joining us all and everybody be there. All, you'll, all, the, you know, all the guys from the Old Testament and everybody that, that knew the Lord. But Moses got in even before that because remember when Jesus was up on the Mount of Transfiguration, who showed up? Moses and Elijah. And so Moses got in the promised land. And of course, by then, I mean, he'd seen heaven. So the promised land probably wasn't as impressive as it would have been to him at that time. But he says, because you didn't hallow me in the midst of the children of Israel, so there's a greater consequence that comes to your life. Yet you shall see the land before you, though you shall not go there into the land which I'm giving the children of Israel. Now there's way too much stuff in 33 and 34. So we're gonna stop there. We're gonna stop a little early. I think we've done that two weeks in a row, and that's all right, because I'd rather do that than just talk any faster than I already have and try to get this last part in. But again, the warnings of the Lord. Here's what God is saying. If you walk with me in holiness, I will bless you. If you don't walk with me in holiness, you're going to have curses. Your life's not going to go well. It's not any more difficult than that, but it's hard for us in these bodies always to obey, isn't it? And so 
you know, tonight, if you're veering off some, this could be a warning from the Lord. Okay, it's time to get back. Don't veer off. Zero back in on the things of God. Zero back in on the word of God. Get close to God again and honor him in all things. And God says, I will bless you um, if you do that. And so that should be our heart and that should be what we should pray for. And also, again, just as a reminder as we finish, hey, storing up good worship songs in your mind. You know, things to pray for. I find that when I'm in situations of testing and trial or being down, certain choruses will come to my mind and just remind me of God's goodness and God's faithfulness, you know, and, and, and you know, encourage me. So I encourage you, again, have that worship music playing in your car, you know. Um, if you have the opportunity and the ability in your house, play it some in your house. That's something I missed. You know, in our, in our house that we had before, we had, it wasn't the best system, but we had a system set up. We could play some worship in the house and all that kind of stuff. And I enjoyed that on, on the times that we did that and, and whatever, and the, et cetera. You know, you, it was a five CD player. And once you heard five CDs or put five more in, it could get old quick. You know, it's good with today's technology. You can just hit some of these that just kind of play a bunch of new stuff all the time. And it's great. But I encourage you to do that. Have worship playing around your house when you can. I want to try to do that in our, in our new home that we're doing. And, you know, have God's word, you know, from here and there on your, somewhere on your counter or your wall or something to remind you of God's goodness. In your car, have those places, you know, where, you know, yeah, you can check out the sports, you can check out the news, nothing wrong in that. But have those places where you can also go and, and, uh, and just hear worship. Because this is the kind of stuff that, again, is going to come back to your mind in those times of trial. It's going to be the encouragement that you need. Let God build you up and encourage you in that. And so, um, anyway, well, let's pray. You can read next week. I feel confident we'll finish next time. Uh, next time is communion, um, so it won't be as long, but I think we can get through chapter 33. And 34 is very short. It just talks about Moses, and uh, we'll see if we get that far next time. But let's pray. Father, your word, again, is so encouraging and builds us up. It's so sweet. I just thank you for what your word is doing, even in our hearts now, God, as the seeds are planted, as you have encouraged us. And God, even as you gave a warning to the children of Israel, if you disobey me, there's going to be these difficulties that come into your life. God, let it be a warning to us. There will be these difficulties if we disobey. There will be blessings if we obey. God, on a personal level, let us make sure that we're walking right with you, that we might walk in that blessing. But Lord, as a nation, I feel like we are a lot like Jeshurun who grew fat and kicked. God, we've, we've grown accustomed to the blessings of this nation and we've kicked against you, not your church, but this nation in many ways. God, forgive us. Have mercy on us. I pray that we would come to our senses as a nation before you remove these blessings and we have to learn it the hard way like the children of Israel did. And I pray, God, that we on an individual basis would come to our senses before we have to learn it the hard way uh, when you hide your face from us, God. Don't hide your face. Lord, let us see your face and see your glory. Let us know you, Lord. Even as Paul said, his greatest desire was to know you. Lord, let us know you. Again, just bless the teaching of your word tonight and thank you for the sweetness, God, of your spirit and for your instruction for us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and praise the Lord. God bless you guys.